we're, we're back. I had a hand messing up emergency, so I had to fix it. Um, let's pray while people come in. Let's start praying. Father, I ask you to bless our time together. I ask you to guide us through this time. I ask that there not be any more snafus. And I ask that you uh, bring in those that you uh, want to have in here. And I ask that those who come, those who come, come ready to, um, to have an experience with you. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Me and Mike are here. So far, anybody else is here. Um, all you people that see this on video, when you look at the YouTube thing, uh, enjoy their prayer. Amen. Okay, so here we are. Uh, our starting verse is Acts 18.23. We're going to get a little bit of a run and start. Mike Rich is here. Um, we're going to go back to 18.18. Now, um, Paul had gone from Corinth, and then he met uh, Priscilla and Aquila. Then he... He comes back. He remains there for a while. <clears throat> then he comes and uh, he leaves for Syria and Priscilla and Aquila with him. He goes to Centuria. We talked about this last time where he had taken a vow, some kind of vow. We're not sure if it was the Nazarite vow or not, but he took a vow. And at the end of it, he had his head shaved as a sacrifice. Then he came to Ephesus. He left Priscilla and Aquila there. He went in to, uh, probably at the um, port. Then he went into the synagogue, reasoned with the Jews, and they asked him to stay a, a long, longer time with them. Um, and for once he didn't do that. Uh, he left. He left them saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem. We're not quite sure why that is. Uh, we just think that um, the Lord was telling him to do it, so he was going to go. He says, but I will return to you, God willing. And then he sailed from Ephesus. He landed at Caesarea. He had gone up and greeted the church, and he went down to Antioch. And after he had spent some time there, he departed. And that's where we are right now. After he had spent some time there, he departed. And he went over to the region of Galatia and Phrygia, in order, strengthening all the disciples. So Paul did this. He went back and he encouraged them. And he edified the disciples. And remember, disciples means um, continual learners. So he, he uh, did that. He edified the continual learners, the disciples. And may we all, may we all be continual learners. May we all be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe God's model for his church today is really like that. Bonjour, a bonsoir, Marie Chagnon from Montreal. Um, I think God's model... For his church today is really like that because there's nothing in the scripture that says he was going to change the way he was doing things. There's supposed to be roving bands of apostles. Remember, apostles and prophets in the scriptures and therefore now aren't uh, cited in one place. They're supposed to uh, rove about, going from place to place, strengthening the church. And ultimately, I believe in the long run, God will bring his, his church back to that. Now in verse 24, now a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man, mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. And remember, this is where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. So he went there originally, he led people to Christ, then he leaves a team of people that he can trust there to continue to disciple him. And he moves on. This is this is our model. This is what's supposed to happen. And I know people that do this today. Now, Paulus is short for the name Apollonius. The way Mike is a, is a short form of the name Michael. He was a Jewish man who was born in Alexandria. And Alexandria is the second most influential city in the entire Roman Empire. Rome, of course, is the first. It was right where it's located to this day, on the Mediterranean Sea, where the Nile leaves Egypt. So where the, um, the, the delta of the Nile uh, is right there on the um, Mediterranean Sea. To this day, Alexandria is located there. It was built by Alexander the Great. And it became a center of Greek scholarship and science. And it was here that the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament, was translated in 285 B.C., so I don't know if you're aware of this, 
the Septuagint was the Old Testament rewritten in Greek. So it's a word for word translation um, from uh, Hebrew to the Greek. I wonder if when a person was known to have come from such an iconic place like Alexandria, if he gained status just from having been born there. Apparently so, apparently so, since Luke thought to mention it in his introduction to Apollos. Luke also describes him as being, and we quote from Acts 18.24, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures. So what scriptures is he mighty in? Well, the Old Testament, because the New Testament wasn't written. And so it, it wasn't even named the Old Testament back then. It was just named the Testament. And so, so it was, um, so he was mighty in that. He knew the Old Testament scriptures. Luke also describes Apollos as being an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures. Most likely he's been trained in the ability to speak with passion and authority in Alexandrian schools. And as a, a Jewish man, he was trained in Alexandrian schools to, in the ability to speak. We're going to move that up. And as a Jewish man, he was very familiar with the Old Testament, and he was bold enough to do something about it. So I just made notes in my copy. And the reason for that is all these studies that I'm doing are eventually going to be uploaded as ebooks to uh, Amazon or whatever's left by the time that happens. And and um, and so when I do that, then we're going to be able to um, to go in and make that into a print book someday. So that's that's the name of the game there. That's what we plan on doing. So when I find a mistake, um, and one day I will take this and send it off to a real live proofreader and editor and have them look at these things before I release it to the world, um, a lot of the boo-boos will be fixed. So that's why every now and then I'll bend down and make a note. Luke says that Apollos is mighty in the scriptures. And that word mighty is the Greek word dunatos, D-U-N-A-T-O-S, or dunatos. And that speaks to being powerful. Perhaps through the Holy Spirit, and his influence. Thoroughly acquainted with the law and the prophets and skilled in the Jewish method of interpreting these scriptures. That's a powerful combination. I mean, look at that. He's, he's powerful through the Holy Spirit influence, thoroughly acquainted with the law and the prophets and skilled in the Jewish method of interpreting them. What a, what a powerful combo. And he's an eloquent man, and he's mighty in the scripture. I, and I want to be one of those when I grow up. Acts 18.25. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. And so he knew about Jesus. And, 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 and so as we're going to go, we're going to see what happens with that. Apollos had a thorough knowledge of the Old Testament, and he knew what he knew. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord. And the word instructed comes from the Greek word catch. I'm not even going to try to spell the uh, pronounce this. Katecheo, C-A-T-E-C-H-E-O, with lots of um, words, lots of little marks on it to emphasize it. You post it up there? Yeah. Okay, I don't know how you say that. Um, which some denominations have transliterated to the word catechism. So anybody you know that that went to uh, maybe maybe Methodist does, if I know Catholics do this, that they um, when kids go like once or twice a week to catechism, that's where that word came from. Uh, even though I'm not sure what I experienced as a kid at catechism looked anything like this, um, but it means instructed. Um, it means someone taught Apollos about the way of the Lord, how to live the Jesus life. So somebody taught him that. Yet whoever taught him failed to teach him the truth about what some people refer to as the believer's baptism. Now I put that in there because it's common in church world to use that term, but believer's baptism isn't, the term isn't found anywhere in the scriptures 
um, that we know. Okay, Meg. Hey, Megan. Didn't know you were there. Hi, um, Megan. Uh, worships in the Methodist style, and they do catechism, and so that's where the word comes from. It means instructed. Um, some, some, as the denominations migrated away from Catholicism, the ones who started first tend to look more like that now hold some of the uh, Catholic ideas and practices. And so that's why Methodists do catechism. Hey, I hope y'all are okay down there and, um, where you live, which is, I know, but I can't remember right now, um, north of Houston. Um, and so, so, um, Nobody taught about what some Christians call believer's baptism, which is the baptism that people uh, experience or, or, or gone, taken through after being born again, after confessing Jesus as their Lord. Then when they become believers uh, or Christians, they're baptized. Nobody told him about that. His knowledge stopped at the message of John the baptizer's baptism, which was, and I'm quoting from when he talks about it early on, to turn away from your sins and turn to God. I think that's in John 1. John's baptism, John the baptizer's baptism, had to do with an outward sign that someone, that one had decided to turn from his sin. Whereas Christian baptism is basically a reenactment of the Holy Spirit baptizing us into Christ upon our salvation when we confess Jesus as Lord. Conroe, yeah, and um, and and so um, it's a different thing. Even though both involved immersion in water, not sprinkling, not pouring, but baptize is a word that's actually um, used in the dunking of cloth in dye. So they would actually baptizo um, cloth into this colored water. So it means burial, basically, in something that changes it fundamentally. While we're on the topic, it bears mentioning that Paul will soon run into others who were born again but were baptized into John's baptism. And we'll see this when we study the first few verses in Acts chapter 19. And so Acts 18.25 again, this man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, being fervent in spirit. And he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. Now, this is interesting because, you know, God's not doing anything, everything perfectly. He doesn't know everything perfectly. But Luke never presents Apollos in the bad light because he, just because he did not know some crucial things. In fact, he says Apollos spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord. There's just some stuff he didn't know. Let's never equate not knowing everything, which in truth, only God can do. Only God can know everything. Let's not equate not knowing everything with being inept. Even though he did not know about Christian baptism, Apollos did teach what he did know accurately, which means that he taught them exactly correct in his doctrine. Luke gives credit where credit is due, even knowing that he's about to report that Priscilla and Aquila are going to help Apollos learn what he needs to know. They're going to help complete the missing parts in what he understands. In fact, Luke says that Apollos was fervent in spirit. And it's a term that's interesting because the word fervent literally tells us that, that Apollos' spirit was boiling. This is one passionate dude, spiritually. I guess we should say that such a person was on fire for the Lord. And if you're wondering where that term comes from, maybe it comes from this. Have you ever met someone like that? It's amazing to watch them work, being who and how, how God made them to be. Apollos should also be given credit for doing exactly what Paul and others were doing by being bold enough to go into synagogues and really, who knows where else? Because we really don't know what he was doing prior to showing up here. But he was willing to go into synagogues and take the risk of being rejected. And we've seen from Paul's first ministry trip that that could get a person killed. Um, he took the risk of getting rejected, hoping that someone would be born again. So credit where credit's due. Now, you know, the reason this is important 
is that one of the things that happens in the institution of Christianity that we're, most of us are really aware of is that is that people will sit back, some of them don't really study, but they will nitpick things that the preacher says, or that whoever's speaking says, or whoever's teaching says, looking for something that's not perfectly correct, and then using that against them instead of doing what Priscilla and Aquila are fixing to do. And, and I think what it does is it, it pours a little bit of uh, water on their fire. And I, I think it's, it's wrong to do that. If a person, especially see this with new Christians, when a person comes out of the blocks, you know, and they're just so excited, they're like a runner and a gun went off and they blast off. I mean, I, I stepped on lots of toes right after I got saved. And, and, and I wish I had, but it did because I was, you know, full of vim and vigor and excited and I pretty much still am. But I've learned uh, how to how to communicate it in such a way that most people aren't going to try to kill me anymore as much all the time. <laughs> and so um, someone will do that. They'll come out and people will just tell them, shut up, calm down. I mean, I actually had people in a church where I was born again, in the building in which I was born again, basically accused me of being um, fervent and being, um, what was that word? Um, some word that Peter said to be like, you know, and the guy said it as an accusation because I was so fired up and I was like, go for it. One of the ladies I passed her who had been born again as a young woman, I met her when she was attending a congregation here in town and the Lord assigned us to that place for a season. And we were there, and I remember when she walked in, and she was burdened, and she had a lot of, a lot of stuff going on. It was it was a rough time in her life, and she was coming out of a bad season. And then we met, and we wound up doing some deliverance and and a bunch of teaching, and she's still like a daughter to me. But at one point, God gave her something to say in the congregation, and the leaders there trusted me. But they still had her in their minds where she was before God did the work that he did. So they wouldn't let her speak. So afterwards, I, you know, she came to me and her feelings were hurt. And I said, you know, come to our house at our next gathering and share what the Lord gave you if you if this hasn't taken the wind completely out of your sails. So she did. She most of the time still attends our gatherings when, when she and her husband can. But one of the leaders, I went up to the leaders, I said, I'm just curious, why why didn't you let her have the microphone? She told me what it was, it was a good word. And um, and the guy said, well, you know, she's kind of a loose cannon. And the place was dead. I mean, it was dead. And I said, you know, she might be the only one shooting anything around here, you know? Why don't you just turn her loose? You know, let her do something. If she says something wrong, you can fix it. But what he did was he dampened her fervor, and I thought that was tragic. Well, if anybody knows her, and um, I can't know who I'm talking about, probably, um, um, it didn't dampen her. We stoked that fire pretty good, you know. And uh, she's running around taking people off on a regular basis. That's awesome, you know, for the Lord. And so in Acts 18:26, Apollos began to speak in the synagogue boldly. Speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, remember, they had been left behind and they were following what uh, Paul did. They were going into the synagogue just like he did. They were ministering to whoever would receive them. And when Aquila and Priscilla, who were there, heard him, they took him aside and they explained to him the way of God more accurately. So Apollo, Apollos went into the synagogue as a Jewish man who was well educated in the Old Testament scriptures. And he was well-educated in rhetoric. In other words, he was taught how to argue and debate and present a case like, like those scholars did and, and those uh, philosophers did in Athens. And he spoke boldly. And the word boldly means that he spoke openly with freedom and frankness and without constraint. The dude was free and he was, he was doing it. This is interesting. Now, generally, when this happens in the modern body of Christ, people look to whoever the spiritual hit man is in the crowd, whoever they deem to be the spiritual head guy, then the crowd parts 
and, and I'm going to pick a name that I know nobody has, Brother Know-It-All. Or sometimes it's Sister Know-It-All. Fixes the guy. And basically the way they fix him is tell him to shut up. Or they shame him. Or they tell him he has to leave. Or they tell him that this isn't the place for that, brother. Or something like that. There's a bunch of ways to quench the Holy Spirit of God in people. And many of these guys are well versed in that. In this case, Apollos and Priscilla and Aquila are in the Jewish synagogue ministering Jesus. So none of the spiritual hitmen there are going to correct Apollos on Christian doctrine. They don't have somebody, we haven't had 2,000 years of error to where we build all these subsystems to keep this current system moving. Um, so that doesn't exist in that place. Aquila and Priscilla aren't spiritual hitmen or hitman and woman. They're going to correct their his brother in Christ and they correct him. These people are capable. They can do this. So in other words, anybody can do it. If you hear someone make a mistake, can you gracefully go to them and pull them aside where they won't be embarrassed? And that's what these people did. They took them aside. So they won't be embarrassed and it won't fuel the flesh that everybody has some of that. And, and basically say, did you know that what the Bible teaches about that is a little bit different than what you said? Speak to one another with grace. You know, like he said, the Bible says, let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth, only those such as to edify one another, to build one another up. Satan's more than willing to tear people down. And there's a whole bunch of people out there who are willing to, to let him use them to do it. Let's resist that. Let's be a counterforce in this. Let's build people up. So they're capable and they can do it. So another interesting thing is that we can also see their sensitivity. Like I said, they don't embarrass the man, nor do they cause any of those present to see that they aren't in agreement with that because that would have brought division. They don't make a big deal about it in front of all the other people in the synagogue because they're into bringing Apollos together with them instead of making a division where everybody else can pick the Apollos aside or pick someone on Aquila's side. So they, they draw them aside. They aren't trying to elevate themselves at Apollos' expense. And that's what the brother know-it-all and sister know-it-all dynamic is really about. It's about somebody knocking someone down and then stepping on top of their body so they can elevate themselves at that person's expense. There's one elevated person in this body of Christ, and that's Jesus. And the rest of us, we're all on the same level plane. Nobody is more anointed than anybody else, although some people are good at music and other people aren't. And some people are good at teaching and other people aren't. Some people are awesome at hospitality and other people aren't, but nobody's better than anybody else. And we should not find ourselves knocking someone down so we can stand on top of them and making ourselves look better. All they care about is that Apollos teaches the truth. i got to remember what the situation is. Church is fairly new. It's only a few years old. Uh, it's been just the second ministry trip that Paul went on. Obviously, we see Priscilla and Aquila were migrating around doing this. Apollos is migrating and doing this. Peter and other apostles are doing this. We have historical accounts of people going all over the place, uh, all over the known world. Um, bringing the gospel. Nobody's the boss of anybody. I love that. So people, and they're out moving about wherever the Lord says for them to go. You know, Philip goes from one place to another, baptizes a guy, and the next thing you know, the Holy Spirit translate him, translates him, just brings him to another place geographically, instantaneously. That is how the church is still supposed to work. So they're not trying to control this dude. They only want to help him do the best job he can do. I think it's beautiful. That same person, I was a hospice chaplain for a while, and, and I made a stand for some biblical things, and it was one of the few times, I think it's the only time in my life that anybody actually fired me. And, and so I went to the same nursing homes, and I was teaching the Bible in the nursing homes, because I had plenty of time. 
<laughs> to do that and the nursing homes received me so I was there and this young lady that I was pastoring showed up and she was she was working for somebody else I think a home health thing or maybe another hospice and she was a, um, a, a nursing assistant and so she showed up and all the CNAs and I, I mean it was amazing to watch them flock to her she was just so charismatic in the social meaning of that um, and the other way too but but um, they were just uh, drawn to her like moths to a light it was amazing and I knew some of these ladies and I knew some of them were drug addicts and I knew most of them were living in sin and I knew them well and I loved them and were um, ministering to them as they would allow but they were attracted to her in the Lord and so she would come to me and she'd go oh, this one needs to come to you for counseling or this one needs to talk to you and, and I would say no no they're not coming to me they've been knowing me for a couple of years they're coming to you you're equipped for this that's what the scriptures is for it's a, uh, in 2nd Timothy I think 316 it says that all scripture is God breathed and it's 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 there for for um, teaching and correction and reproof and training I said you got what it takes Otherwise, God wouldn't have turned you loose with them. So just want to encourage you, you know, you don't have to have some letters behind your name. Or you don't have to have pieces of paper on your wall like I have up there, which are great, and they get me into some places. But you don't have to have that kind of documentation to represent the kingdom of God. You're an ambassador for the king. That means that you have the right to go in and speak the things he has you speak. To me, it doesn't get any better than that. I just love it. And so all these people care about, say, he teaches the truth. They don't know where it's going to go next. It doesn't matter to them. They want, they're want they presuming, I guess, that, that he's going to go wherever the Lord sends him, just like they are. So all they care about is that he teaches what's true. So they adjust that, but they don't hurt the man doing it. They don't want to quench his fervor. So they pull him aside. And I love how Luke phrases this. He says, they explain to him the way of God more accurately. And let's not, let's not miss this. They assessed where he was spiritually. And for the, whatever they call the group that does this all the time, this is not judgment. You know, don't judge me. This isn't judgment. This is evaluation. So they evaluate where he is and they, they figure out this is what this guy knows. This is what he knows about the way of God. And they take him from where he is to the next place that Jesus had for him. For Apollos that day, this scripture out of Philippians 1.6 was happening, the second half, was happening for him. And Mike just posted it here. He who has done a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. That was happening for Apollos that day. That word complete in Philippians 1.6 simply means to fulfill further or to further fulfill. Something in Apollos wasn't what it could be. And this day, when he meets Priscilla and Aquila, the Lord uses two fellow Christians to move him further along to his own personal completion. And when's that going to go on for us? Till the day of Jesus Christ. And there's two ways to interpret that. One is if we're alive the day the sky splits and there's a shout like a trumpet in the sky and, and Jesus reappears, that's the day of the Lord. Or for any of us who died before then, that's our personal day of the Lord when we meet him face to face. Mike has a question. Uh, our, when we are talking with um, other Christians and we're in that process of, hey, you're good to go, but here, let me share this with you and to elevate them as like what you're sharing right here. They don't receive it. They think that you're trying to uh, or yeah. what the way they believe is different than what you believe. So what do you do? What do you do? Okay, I don't know if you can hear it. Marie, could you hear what he was saying? Or, or uh, Megan, could you hear what Mike was saying? 
So I'm not sure how well these mics pick this up. But for those who didn't, he wants to know, what do you do when someone teaches something that's not quite right, and you do this, and you do it in a grace-filled way, like Apollo and I mean Priscilla and Aquila did, and they won't receive it? What do you do? Well, my rule of thumb is, is uh, something I'm going to quote in, in the next chapter of this study. And also, Megan can hear you pretty well, so the whole world knows your voice now. You know, or the little tiny splinter of it that's going to uh, be a part of this. Um, my rule of thumb is, is what happens when Jesus um, takes these guys and tells them, I want you to go out and I'm looking for it, seeing if I, if I quote it here. Yeah, it's in Matthew 10. He says, when you go into a household, when he sent out the 12, and then later, I presume, when he sent out, I think it was 50 after that, uh, 70 after that, when you go into a household, greet it. If the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. If it isn't worthy, let your peace return to you. And whoever will not receive you or hear your words, when you depart from that house or city, shake the dust off your feet. And what that means is, basically, in the words of... Um, Mafiosa everywhere, forget about it. Um, now, if it's something you're really passionate about, admittedly, it's a little hard to do that. But our role, if God calls us to bring something to someone, anyone, whether it be a physical gift or an act of service or correction or gen even gentle and loving correction, is to do it, to try to do it. If we're not received, that's not our job. And so what I, I suggest, and believe me, when you're in the counseling world, or when you're in the um, when you're in the ministry world, and you constantly have an opportunity to share something, there will be more opportunity if the more you extend yourself, and the more you make yourself available, the more you are available to be rejected. And that's just part of it. And you can see it all through the book of Acts. If you if you read through it slow, you see there are people at at the beginning. I mean, when when um, when Pentecost happens and the Holy Spirit falls, like some of the people are going, "These dudes are drunk." It's only nine in the morning. You know that kind of thing. There's always going to be people who reject our what what our word is or what our work is or what our gift is. Then basically you just graciously back away. And I'll tell you, there is grief involved in that. Especially if you know that what you have, I mean, there's no grief like the grief of trying to lead a person to the Lord and they blow you off and you know that they, if they die in that situation, then you, they're never going to see them in eternity. They're going to they're gonna go to hell. We have to learn the art. If we're, either we're going to bubble wrap ourselves and not take any risks on behalf of the kingdom of God, or we're going to take risks and we need to learn how to manage those risks. And if we're going to manage those risks, then the best way to do it would be the way the Lord did it. There were times when, when um, the rich young ruler came up to Jesus and said, I've done everything, I'm a paraphrase, I did everything perfectly all my life. I'm awesome. You know, and he says, what do I need to do? And he says, sell all your stuff and follow me. Give it away. And the guy can't do it. And the guy leaves. Well, I believe Jesus was, had deep grief there. And that's where he says it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. And for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God, <clears throat> he's not happy about that. But he also doesn't go chasing and dragging the guy, kicking and screaming back to him. He lets him go. And so that's just part of what we do. And so that's a great question because a lot of people won't won't do it. And basically I go, okay, see you later. You know, and off I go. And then later I go and offload that to the Lord. Father God, this hurts. I know that there could be they could do better, and I know you told me to, to go. It's almost like the Lord prompts you and pokes you to go, and you go and do it, and then you get rejected. Well, what he says is when they reject, anybody who re rejects you rejects me, something like that. There's a quote about that where Jesus says that, that if they reject you, they're really rejecting me. So if they reject the messenger, and the message is a good message the Lord has, then they're really rejecting the origin of the message, and that would be the Lord. And that's sad, but that's the way it is. And I told maybe the last time or the time before about a guy named Steve who had the message of salvation for me. And three different times, 
I offered to hurt him if he kept telling me about that. You know, and I wasn't rejecting Steve. I was rejecting God. And praise God that I stopped doing that, you know, and, and I went and told Steve about it. But that's the way it works. Either we're going to extend ourselves into someone's situation and basically make ourselves available to be rejected, or we're not. But but here's the thing. The question always is, is is loving that person in that way, even though they might reject you, is it worth whatever you'll feel if you get rejected? And my answer is always yes. It's always worth it. And so so I think it's worth it. Um, it's a little easier after a thousand of those you know, <laughs> than it was the first time. But then there's also many people that receive you too. And that's pretty cool. And if, you, if you're around me and you ever see me, minister with somebody for the first time, then I, I often will say this sentence, and I mean it. Thank you for receiving me, because it means so much to me. There's nothing like it. If God built you like Megan, Megan is gifted on the piano. When somebody said, please play for our congregation, that's good. didn't it feel good? It felt good to be harvested. To have the gift God put in her harvested. I remember the day she told me about it. And it was just awesome to hear it. That's a pretty cool thing. To know that God took the time to equip somebody. And then someone else recognizes it. And, and received that gift from the Lord through that human being. Man, that's awesome. Heck yeah, she says. I love it. Yeah, I remember that. That was cool, wasn't it? You drive many miles to practice that. Um, and so another part of Acts 18.26. So what I do is I, if there's lots of stuff in here, I'll repeat it over and over again and then emphasize a different part. Just now we were talking about um, them ex explaining to them more, um, more accurately. We're going to look at that a little bit more. So I began to speak boldly. Apollos began to speak boldly in, in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla um, heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. I absolutely love this section of scripture. I really do. I love it because it's a picture of how God intends for his one church to function as a loving family, a family which loves one another and him and his word and his ways. That's how it's built. Megan says... But then to be able to use that gift to do the Lord's work is way better. Nothing like knowing you're at least a bit living in God's will for your life. Well, you know, I think you're doing that by raising your children. I think you're doing that by your work. I think you're doing that. And and, and you're, you're doing the Lord's work when you do your medical work. You're doing the Lord's work when you correct your children or help them with homework. And, and you're doing the Lord's work if you're in a a building that people call church and you play the piano. You're doing the Lord's work. You can do the Lord's work in Walmart, just shopping. You know? Um, a little bit harder for me to do that. Harder for me to wrap around. That is an act of worship. But okay. Acts 18, 27. And when he desired to cross the Acacia. Now, now watch what happens here. Um, it's the truth, Megan. And the Bible says, whatever you do in word and deed, do it as unto the Lord. It doesn't say these ones are spiritual, these other ones aren't because they're not happening in a church building or a church gathering like a um, conference or something. Uh, but if you do it more than deed, do it as unto the Lord. Um, and so Apollos desired to cross over to another place, Acacia. When he did, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. This is beautiful. Apollos did not tell him. He says, you know, you can imagine the conversation. Well, Aquila and, oops, not Apollos. Um, oops, I'm pressing the wrong buttons on my computer. Um, Apollo, I'm sorry, Aquila did not tell him, you don't know enough, Apollos. You don't have enough training. You're not, you're not able to do this. You're disqualified from ministering. They don't tell him that. Instead, they lovingly addressed his misconceptions, 
sent him where he was hungry in Christ to go to minister. And they helped him go. Luke says that the brethren wrote. Now, I have in my notes here that I wrote, Priscilla and Aquila wrote letters. But it might have been all the Christians in that place. I don't know. Priscilla and Aquila wrote letters to the disciples, to the learners who were already in Acacia. And they wrote to them, exhorting them to receive him. They were encouraged to fully welcome Apollos and allow him into their hearts. And this is so exciting to me. It shows how in the first century, Christians respected one another's spiritual gifts, even with all our imperfections. This man was a powerhouse for the Lord. And they tuned him up a little bit, and then they turned him loose. I love that. You know, at one time I was invited to go to a congregation. It doesn't exist anymore, um, but it was outside of St. Louis, and some people I pastored that lived up there were attending this place, and they were serving. And and um, I went. I would go there, you know, and, and visit them and because a pastor might travel to St. Louis two or three times a year and I would attend this congregation. In fact, I helped carry all the chairs in there when they finally got their super duper building and and um, nobody else, me and one other guy helped carry these chairs and I wasn't even going to attend there because I live in Texas but I was serving them. I, knew, I saw a need and so I went and helped and um, they talked to the leaders of the church and they did this basic thing. They, they encouraged, they exhorted those disciples to receive me. And then there came a time when they turned me loose in the pulpit and I taught a Sunday service from the pulpit and then I did my conference there. Actually brought a team of people from here all the way there, paid their way, found places for them to stay. It was great. It was really a fun time. And um, trying to equip the brethren using the gifts that God has given me and the things that I've learned much of which I learned by boo-boos. Um, so they, they respected his gifts and they, they tuned him up and turned him loose. I think that's awesome. I really do. In my little portion of the kingdom, that I don't own it, but just in a little por portion of the kingdom in which I find myself, in which I practice the reasons that I exist in Christ, it has been my pleasure for quite some time to encourage others to walk in their gifts. I know I've, I've done that with Mike here, done that with Megan, I've done that with Marie Chagnon up there in um, um, Montreal. It's been my pleasure to encourage others to walk in their gifts. I exhort them to be the ones praying, ministering with me as their backup. Sometimes I initiate the ministry. Often, somebody else does and I don't step up because I have a title or those where are they, pieces of paper up there over my shoulder. Now, for many years I attended a men's meeting on Thursday nights um, and once at a men's meeting we had an opportunity to minister deliverance which basically means spiritual freedom to a person, a guy that was there it was a men's meeting. It seemed that it was my place that time to oversee that ministry. But I encouraged all the other men to pray and speak into it as the Lord led. And so I, I basically initiated it and I kind of set the tone and we were being received. But then I stepped back and watched these other guys. And sometimes we had as many as 20 people on a Thursday night. And each took their turns laying hands on this guy. And, and um, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. I just watched over it. The men got up as God led, laid hands on the man, and they took turns praying. I mean, it wasn't a dry eye in the house. And I just watched over it. I played my equal part, but I certainly wasn't elevated. This very thing has happened at our gatherings, our house church meetings. For many years, as the Lord has led, someone will say, I need prayer. And someone else will get up and go over there and pray for him. It's not always me, and I, I think that's right. Often it's not me. And I often don't bring a teaching. It's whatever God says. Sometimes I do. 
Sometimes I don't. And this is what happened when Paul and Aquila and Priscilla came to town. Aquila and Priscilla stepped up and they practiced their gifts as equals to the great apostle Paul. And so Acts 18.27, the second half, when Apollos desired to cross to Acacia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. Luke tells us that Apollos greatly helped those who believed through grace. The word helped is a Greek word that literally means to combine. It has to do with connecting this people, these people who had believed, in other words, Christians, with other Christian people, and also connecting, connecting these Christians, these new believers and the ones who are already there, connecting them all with godly ideas. And that's what we do, right? I mean, heck, one of the guys, a pastor, came up from Houston last week, and we were eating in a restaurant locally. We were at a hometown restaurant and and we were talking and I said hey have you ever considered because because we were talking he ministers to people who are coming out of sexual brokenness um, homosexuality and um, people that hooked on porn all kinds of stuff right and and he's he was talking about how um, when he's when he's ministering over Skype or zoom or whatever it is in Latin America that when someone says could you pray for me that he does what I do often, and and that's okay. You know, let's pray right now. And he was talking about how 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 it blesses them. It really touches their hearts that he does it. And I said, Have you ever considered that when you and I do that, it might be the first time in some of these people's lives that anyone actually prayed out loud for him right there, right then, when when it was on their heart to say it. You know, some you know you know what it's like probably where you, you're holding something inside and you really want to deal with it, but you don't, and then finally you just can't hold it in anymore and you blurp it out. And often it's like it evaporates. Maybe someone will say, I'll pray for you, and then you don't know if they ever do or not. And often nobody does. They forget about it because life is busy. But it means something when you blurp it out, when you, you can't hold it in anymore. I know, I've done it. It means something when someone lays, lays hands on you right now. Years ago when I was in Houston, I, um, I was so discouraged at something I was seeing. I was seeing spiritual things, and it was backed up with what I could see with my eyeballs. You know, and it was breaking my heart. And I walk up to this guy named Richard Hinojosa, big guy. It used to be a, a Mexican gang guy, I think, and... Now he's got this soft heart of gold and a wonderful man. And um, he said, brother, what's wrong? You don't look like you feel good. And I said, well, I'm, I'm, um, I'm discouraged. And he just pulled me into this hug and began to pray for me. And it meant so much to me. I just think this is cool. You know? And what he was doing when he prayed for me was combining. He was helping he was combining me as a fellow Christian with ideas that God was giving him to pray for me. He was combining it. How would Apollos do this? How would he help them? Luke said he did it through grace. He, he greatly helped those who believed through grace. Now, it could be that the word believed through grace is that that's how they came to be saved. He was saved by grace, through faith, but through, by grace, right? But uh, by grace through faith. Um, but it could be that he helped them through grace. And the word grace is a Greek word, charis, C-H-A-R-I-S. And it's where we get the words charisma and charismatic. It doesn't have to do with people jumping over pews and running laps around church buildings and doing stuff that's a little weird looking to people that aren't used to that. And sometimes people who are used to it. Um, um, it basically is where Chris, and it has to do with the divine influence of the Holy Spirit upon the heart of a man or woman who's yielded to God, the Holy Spirit. That's, that's what the word means. Charismatic has to do with people who allow God to affect their hearts, and sometimes it affects their words and their actions and their giving and all kinds of stuff. So this tells us that this man, Apollos, went to Acacia under the power of the Holy Spirit of God 
and he helped the people because it was really God at work through him. So Acts 18, 27 to 28, look at that verse along with the next verse, which is a continuation of the same sentence. And when he desired to cross to Acacia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples in Acacia to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace, for he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. Now Luke says that what Apollos did in Acacia was helpful to the Christians there. You know, I wonder sometimes if that was that they hadn't thought of the ways that he was fixing to do this. Um, what he did was he vigorously refuted the Jews there, the leaders of the Jews. The word refuted means to convince fully, without a doubt. Do you sometimes say, that teaching stretched me? You ever use that term? That's what the word vigorously means. He vigorously refuted them. So he, his teaching stretched them to the point where he was able to convince them fully, without a doubt. Let's think about this, the setting. The setting is that there are people, most likely, who were Jews, who were born again. There are other Jews who's not. When you have family members that aren't saved, how do you feel? You know, when you have friends that aren't saved yet, how do you feel? You feel that tension, and you feel that hunger, and that, that like anticipatory grief that something might happen to them, and they might not be born again. I have people I love that I feel this way for. That's how these people felt for their fellow Jews who aren't born again yet. Don't you know it helped them to see them be fully convinced? So there's, he affects their minds, right? He used his training in debate and in public speaking to make a strong case from the Old Testament scriptures that Jesus is the Christ, the long hope for a Messiah. That's what they're used to. They know, they know the Old Testament. And what he's able to do is connect the dots. He, he, um, he helps them. He completes them. He combines them. So here's Jesus, who is talked about in the Old Testament scriptures, and especially in Isaiah and places like that, but all over the Old Testament. And he combines them with those scriptures and so that they can see that what they know and love it also brings them to the Messiah that they want. He helps them. It's cool to see the Lord in action. He sends Apollos, who's been trained his whole life for this, and then became born again. And it's a beautiful picture of God orchestrating the placement of resources at just the right place and just the right time. You know, each one of us, whoever we are and whatever we do for a living, or if we're retired, each one of us is God's resources for this lost world. Just like Paul, Silas, Timothy, Peter, Titus, Aquila, Priscilla, and Apollos were. John, Mark, there's so many we know about already. Philip, Peter, all, of, all the apostles. God knows what you are. We're just like them. God knows what you are and how you've been equipped, and where you are. He knows. He places his resources as he sees fit. So, so I say, keep your eyes open. Be on the alert. Look around. See what God would have you address. Go for it. Paul says in Ephesians 2.10, For we are his workmanship. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works. What good works? The one which God prepared beforehand. So we should walk in them. So we should practice them habitually. He knows what he's doing. God will send us where he thinks we are the most needed. The question is, will you go? You know, now's the time to decide if you're going to obey his call when he issues the command. Not at the last moment. Make a decision, whatever it takes. I'm doing it or I don't think I have it now. Please don't close the door on that. If you don't think you have it, you do. But if you don't think you do, 
then don't put that like I'll never will. Maybe God will in the future. Maybe you'll catch up with his awareness that he knows what he's doing. You know, and maybe you'll feel like you can do it later. Never feel like if you missed a situation that you're disqualified for us to time. What a waste. What will you do? Will you go? Apollos had moved from Ephesus to Acacia and was living in Corinth, the provincial capital of Acacia. Remember, Acacia is a region. Apollos is mentioned a few times in the word in ways that reveal that he had emerged as a strong leader in the church, which would, and that's people, right? The strong, strong leader in the church, which was in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 1.12, it says this, Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Apparently, Apollos had a following similar to those Peter and Paul had developed. You know, the thing is, if, if, you're, if you're a capable teacher or a loving person, there are going to be some people that will tend to kind of be like sub-disciples of Christ through you, you know. But he had a following. Paul cautioned against this. Our allegiance must always do to Jesus first and foremost. And our identity must come from him as well. Still, we can just see from how many times Apollos is mentioned in Paul's first letter to Corinthians that he was well received there. In 1 Corinthians 3, 4 to 6, it says, from verse 4 through 6, it says this. For when one says, I am a Paul, or and another says, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Aren't you acting like just mere lost people? Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers from whom you believe, through whom you believe, as the Lord gave to each one. So each of them had a part in it. He says, I planted, Paul's, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So, you know, Apollos apparently uh, went from unknown to running into Priscilla Aquila and got turned loose, and then he turned into a, a force to be reckoned with in the church. Paul also, at a later date, dispatched Paul, Apollos back to Corinth to minister there. He says in uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 12, Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to come to you with the brethren, but he was quite unwilling to come at this time. However, he will come when he has a convenient time. And then finally, regarding Apollos, the Apostle Paul called for Apollos to join him in in Necropolis between his first and second imprisonments in Rome. He says in Titus 3.13, Send Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their journey with haste that they may lack nothing. In other words, he doesn't want them to miss out on anything. And they're great. I love, I love how Paul writes. I find it interesting how God connects people who never knew the others existed at one time, but later became such intimate friends and co-workers in the kingdom. Heck, I'm sitting with a guy that grew up in Boyd, Texas. I never knew he existed, and we spend every Tuesday lunch together, and a lot of other times together, God has connected us. Uh, each one of you, I think, everybody that's here, if y'all all said hello when you came in, did God did that for us. I didn't know who you were, and now I do. And you didn't know who I am, and now you do. So let's pray, and I'm going to close by asking the Lord to give us plenty more of that. So, Father, I ask you to bless all those who, who view this and all those who have been a part of that today. I ask you to bless us with the things that we learned. I ask you to show us how to approach one another with grace and love, correcting with gentleness and meekness so that we don't put anybody's fire out. I ask you, um, for those of us who might have done that, and... Um, and rained on somebody else's parade that um, that we go to you and ask forgiveness and that you teach us how to do it a better way. I ask that you, uh, I thank you for connecting us like you did Apollos and Paul and, and uh, Priscilla and Aquila and all those other people in the scriptures um, with people that they had no idea existed before they met. It's how it works in life. Um, I ask that, that you uh, uh, show us how to fully harvest these relationships, not taking advantage of anybody, not going to anybody to get, but going to each other to give and be a part 
and coming away with something anyway because that's how you built this. I asked you to connect us with other people that we don't know any at this time, but will. And uh, we'll turn out at the end of our days to have been key parts in your supply for us and then also in, in places and people that you'd like us to pour into. I thank you that the church is still being built the way it was in the first century. I ask you to show us how to work around any systems that are in place, whether it be government or um, religious systems or um, prejudice systems or anything like that. Show us how to work around those to uh, be the body of Christ anyway. And I thank you for that. And I praise you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it when you come. Um, I want to say, and I should have put this in Mike's notes. Um, this will be uh, loaded up on the website later on. It'll be, it'll be um, on my YouTube channel, but you can always go to the video button at MikeMac.org. You can also go to this place. Um, and um, look at the 250 or 60 articles that are there. Some of them by other people that I thought were good. Um, I'll probably load one up that I found somewhere else if I get permission to do that uh, about why academia works the way it does um, against the church. So um, against um, what we consider to be right ideas. So anyway, I'll see you next time. I hope you all have a good night. I hope you have a good week. God bless you. I love you guys. I'll see you later. Bye-bye.